Get started. We're, Donna, we're getting started. Yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Aida Slanian, and I'm an appellate attorney, and I will try today to connect with you guys on some of the issues of visitation, especially in, in, in reference to what we're starting to see or we would like to see in the record so that we are best able to protect our mutual clients in the various scenarios that are developing. And I, I, I'm going to be skipping around a little bit, but I want you to understand that I'm looking at things primarily from my point of view and what I'm attempting to impart to you is the things that I and other appellate attorneys are, would like to see in the record, sometimes are, are hoping to see in the record, and it's not always developed. Because you have to bear in mind, as appellate attorneys, we cannot introduce new factual matters. That's, the courts will not allow it. We cannot present arguments that were not at least presented in the trial court, even if they were ultimately denied. If there has been no mention of something in the trial court, the courts of appeal take a very bad view of us raising it for the first time on appeal. And I know I've also made, uh, held the line when the, the, the department tries to do as much and have argued the same that Appellate courts are not courts of trial, they're courts of review. And with that in mind, I'd like to approach some of the issues uh, that uh, I would like to speak about today. And one of them being that, and this is just not my, my input, it's a lot of us uh, appellate attorneys. When we have a termination of FR, and for whatever reason, the parent has been unable to reunify with the child. Perhaps they've fallen off the wagon one last time, whatever. But up until that period of time, we've had good visitation and it's reported as good. Parent is coming in with toys and, and food and spending hours of time visiting two to three hours a, a week with the child. A child is responsive, runs up to the parent, yes mommy, yes daddy, whatever. We so we have the court say, okay, you're out of time. We are terminating reunification uh, services. And then in some courts and in some jurisdictions more than others, the next thing that follows is, and now mom or dad who's been visiting five, four times a week, you only get one visit for one hour once a month. There is no showing of detriment. There is no argument that it, uh, uh, the child would benefit from, from this extreme reduction in visitation time. And yet, no one seems to argue against it. Parents' attorneys, minors' attorneys say nothing when the reduction goes in. And the two sticks is set in the 120 days and we're going to proceed to adoption. Nothing is being said. Now, on appeal, I'm stuck with that nothing. And the problem here is that some, some departments have even come in and said, hey, this is our policy. We have a local policy. When uh, we terminate FR, or where the court terminates FR, uh, we, our policy is to only allow one visit a month. And my response to that is, 
So local policy is abrogating statutory law. Is that what we're saying? We're allowing local policy to take away from statutory law that says uh, visitation should be as frequent as possible, which is in the best interest of the child. And those who have deemed to even respond to it have said, in responding briefing, have said, well, yes, we don't think it's in the best interest, we don't think it's in the best interest of the child because the child is slated to go for adoption and we don't want to confuse the child because in three months adoption may be ordered. And my response to that again is, any confusion from an adoption, if an adoption is in fact ordered by the court, can be addressed subsequent to the adoption with therapy once the child is in the adoptive home. Why penalize the child and the parent from the relationship when there has been no showing of detriment and no showing of any reason to, to attenuate the relationship between child and, and uh, parent? The second issue I have with that is that, in fact, this policy point blank foreseeably is taking away from the parent's ability to argue the C1B1 exception when the uh, adoption proceeding does take place because the frequent contact has been attenuated. It is, it is much more, as it is, as it is and as we all know. Uh, the C1B1 exception is one of the most argued and <coughs> the least successful throughout the state. Recognized by all the courts of appeal. In fact, it's become almost an illusory kind of an ar uh, argument. I don't know why we have the statute if nobody's going to enforce it. That being said, it's even worse to have the department intentionally attenuate that relationship and foreseeably affect the parent's ability to, to uh, bring forth that argument at, at the adoption hearing. And I think that is an improper use of any local policy, any courtroom, uh, um, and, and I don't think it serves anybody. I don't think it serves the child. I don't think it serves the parent. And I don't think it serves the system. Unfortunately, whenever I have argued that in appeal, the answer has been the issue is forfeited. It was never challenged in the trial court. So please, folks, if nothing else, do a, a cursory challenge if you are confronted with this kind of a of a, of a situation so that on appeal those of us who have to carry the ball have something to, to raise and say look the court abused its discretion because this was argued and it denied without any evidence that it was uh, detrimental to the child. It's worth a shot and at least it's something that we can protect easily at the trial court level. Uh, then one thing I've seen, and I'm not sure I've got the answer, but I certainly have the questions, is um, when we have a special needs child, and I've noticed that, at least in the appeals I have been doing, there seems to be a great reluctance to liberalize the parents' visits with a special needs child, even when the parent is addressing whatever the parent needs to address, be it drugs, be it alcohol, and be it mental health. Now, mental health is tricky in and of itself for the parent, but let's say whatever it is, we have glowing reports about this parent coming on board and doing everything that we have promised them that if they do, reunification should be accomplished. And then we have the department who starts finding reasons why the special needs child 
should not be, uh, uh, the visit should not be more liberalized. Well, mom uh, may not know the actual medical condition. Well, there may be a therapy that mom is unfamiliar with that the child is undergoing for developmental uh, problems. And I think that then it comes down to trial court level for the attorneys, for the parents to ask from the get-go a more specifically designed case plan that allows the parent to become part of that process, that allows the parent to be able to, those that are able to, go to medical appointments along with the foster parents to get information perhaps from the doctors uh, that are treating the child, to attend therapy sessions. Uh, for the child. And what I have seen in some cases is when in fact the parent is coming aboard and is able to actually perform at a level where they can participate in these special classes, all of a sudden the arena for providing the services is changed to the foster home, which, because it is confidential, the parent cannot access and is unable to participate. And then we come back to the 12 or uh, month hearing or whatever, and it is, the argument is made, well, the parent knows nothing about Junior's uh, problem, so we can't possibly uh, uh, liberalize, we have, we, we have to go ahead and terminate uh, reunification services. And I suggest we start thinking, if that's the case, we start thinking in terms of, well, have reasonable services been provided here? We knew from get-go the limitations of the child. We knew from get-go the limitations of the parents. And these generalistic, oh, parenting classes for age-appropriate children may well be, but did we design something in there that says, hey, think about the special needs of the kid. And think about providing the parent with these specialized services. Or maybe hands-on experiences. This is something that has to be addressed from the very beginning because we're going to bump into it at the end of the line. And on appeal, we may or may not be able to raise a reasonable services argument. But again, that depends whether it was even approached in the trial court. Because if not, I, my friend the forfeiture is going to hit me right in the face. And there is a lot that can be done. I think that, granted, not all parents are going to be able to step up to the plate. But for those who are, and for the children that, that they have uh, uh, in the system, we deserve to give them a sporting chance. And if you have had any kind of experiences in this regard that you want to share or you think we can use on appeal, by all means, please do not be reticent. I know that I personally like to keep a very close ongoing dialogue with trial counsel. And those who will allow me, uh, we will talk ad infinitum. <laughs> <laughs> and him. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I can only learn from the experiences of trial counsel because you guys are in the trenches. I see it after the fact from a, from a cuckoo's point of view, but I need the people who have everyday experiences to bring us nuances so that we can start adopting our arguments on appeal. And I also need you people to make the arguments during the trial court that I can extrapolate and, and then raise on appeal. Because we're a team. I can't work without you guys and I can't raise things that aren't there. As much as I have attempted to in the past. <laughs> then, so, and then we have 
the, almost the counterpart of that, but it's the flip side from the parent's point of view. And I'm seeing cases where mom, it's usually mom, but not always, uh, or dad, has a mental health issue. And it's increasingly becoming a problem, at least in the appeals that I'm seeing. Okay, if reunification is our goal, then what are we doing to prepare this parent, provided one is willing and able to follow the regimen and takes the meds and does everything proper, and we have reports from uh, therapists that are saying, uh, well, this, this mom is now turning around, the stabilizes, whatever. Mm -hmm. So what, what then can we do to start positioning these parents to start having some unmonitored visitation, to have a little longer visits. It's a dicey situation. I can see an avoidance of risk. I can see a liability issue, but by the same token, if we're never going to allow these people to reunify with their children, then, then we should tell them up front, uh, you're done, the case comes in, and not torture everybody with, with review hearings. But that's not what the law provides, and until it changes, we all have an obligation to work within the system to try and bring about some kind of reunification. And I, I understand it's not easy, I don't know how I would react if that responsibility were placed on, on my shoulders in the trial court or as, as the judicial officer, but we need to go beyond the preconceived ideology of mental health being a, a definitive something that's going to prevent parenting. And I don't think we've arrived at that situation yet. I think we all read or see mental health and flags go up of all kinds. We read and see labels such as schizophrenia, bipolar, manic depressive, and all sorts of learned responses come into place that I think we need to re-educate ourselves, the bench and everybody else, because things are changing. If nothing else, look at the commercials on TV. You can't get away from it. The little blue pill that will fix everything, and you will be, um, you know, super mom and super dad within whatever. But there is certainly a movement out there that this is a disease like any other. We wouldn't think of discriminating against the parent because they've got diabetes. We wouldn't think of discriminating against the parent if they have um, cancer. Why is it that when they have an illness that's mental illness, we nevertheless allow the prejudices to come in? I'm not sure I got the answers, but at least if you guys in the proper cases feel you can make the arguments in good conscience, since we're all officers of the court, then I think that on appeal, in the proper cases, we can, we can pick that up and, and, and move it forward. And I think that the courts of appeal are starting to be a little more amenable. They're saying, just from the fact of mental illness, you cannot assume this parent is an endangerment to the child. We're starting to see a little bit of change in that direction. I think we need to push it a little forward. And I was talking to some people uh, before the lecture started in an area which I won't cover because I think it's developing and I don't know what the answers is, not even what the questions are. But now that we have a legitimization of marijuana, how is that going to play out in the dependency court? How is that going to play out in the pleadings, in the visitation we allow, in, in continued visitation, liberalization, and even in return? Are we going to, in fact, hold to the old standards and say as long as there's drug use, a child may not come home? 
Will that still hold if they have a legitimate marijuana card and a medical marijuana card? It's, it's a question that is yet to be answered, but I think the groundwork is going to have to depend on stuff that takes place in the trial court. Because I can, <laughs> I can tell you for a fact, the courts of appeal will not entertain it for the first time on appeal. The first time I raised it, uh, that it was an infringement of the Compassionate Act, I believe I, I got creamed. Uh, it was, and I forget the case name, um, which is cited often, but uh, maybe that's why I blocked it. <laughs> but interestingly enough, in two years afterwards, uh, in the case of uh, Drake M., the same judicial officer, the same court, did a total about face and came up with the decision saying, hey, just because dad is using doesn't mean he's endangering the kid. So there's, there's room for progress. And it's going to be a challenge because I don't know how, how the parameters of, of this are going to play both in the trial court and certainly not on appeal. Now, another thing that I've seen that has affected in some cases, and in one particular case I'm thinking about, um, visitation, was where, and the facts, I'm, I'm going to give general since I'm, I can't uh, confuse the cases. I may be confusing the cases anyway, but it's a situation where you have parents who are otherwise good parents, appear to be taking good care of the children, but dad is uh, running a, a, a drug um, selling business off the premises, or has, yeah, uh, he's an entrepreneur, and he's, <laughs> he's a working man. So uh, the wife may or may not know, but certainly it is not affecting the quality of the care that the children are getting. Children are impervious to any, any of this, and they have great relationship with the parents. The department comes in, it's a sting operation, they, they take dad, uh, they may even take mom, and their relatives in the neighborhood, I'm going to neighborhood meaning within a five, 15 mile, 20 mile radius, but the department doesn't place with any of the relatives, even though some seem to be legitimate that would pass uh, clearances, and places the children 80 miles away. And their justification for this is that, well, uh, given dad's activity, there may be retaliation against family, and we don't want the children to be uh, uh, hurt in the process. Okay, that seems to be a consideration, although I didn't see anything in the record where they had investigated other alternatives what they are <coughs> investigated, whether the relatives would be able to safeguard. Perhaps there may have even been somebody in law enforcement amongst those relatives. I don't know because it was not ever looked into. And instead, we <coughs> had the children placed far away. And in so doing, there was no assistance uh, provided for the parents to visit and they would travel at their own cost long distances to be able to visit perhaps for an hour or two. And what I labeled, and, and of course there was a criminal case pending, and what I think the, the intent in that case was really that they watch, were trying, not so much that they were concerned as much about the safety of the children, as safeguarding the integrity of any testimonies those kids would pre perform or give in the uh, upcoming criminal trial. So they were acting in lieu of a witness protection program. 
And my first argument was dependency is not intended to be a witness protection program. We are here to reunify parents with children. And if you put all the impediments in the world in, in that process for reasons unrelated to dependency, and there was no, no showing really that mom, let's say, was anything other than unable to protect, then the, the justification for putting a child that far away was, was unwarranted. Into the equation then comes, if you splinter the children in four different foster homes, whose best interests are you protecting? Uh, now <coughs> the parents have even a more splintered approach to visitation, perhaps in different geographical locations. The children have been split apart and they don't understand why and what part of that is in the best interest of the children, not to mention where does this in any way move towards fostering reunification. These are, and I think in those situations it is appropriate to come back and ask the courts to make orders for the department to account what closer homes it has investigated, when, <coughs> whether it could accommodate all the placement of the children, and what is the proximity of those homes to the, to the parents' uh, uh, environment so that they can, they can uh, keep up a uh, constant and, and, more, uh, a visit, and visit more often. Because even when the courts make an order saying, departments, tell me what other foster homes have looked into, all I usually get and what you usually get in the record is something that says, and we investigated other homes and they were improper, so we're leaving the kids 80 miles away. Well, as far as I'm concerned, that's not good enough. I want to know who did you talk to, what homes did you look, what vicinity, what radius did you look, what dates did you look, and why was it, and was it, were you looking for placement of three of the children or just one at a time? And I think that information is pertinent to the court, that information is pertinent for us, and it's important for, for the parents. We need to know what efforts have been put in. And if, and if the order is not complied with, I think you may think about perhaps suggesting that it should be brought within 10 days, a, a new a supplemental report may want to come in. And if not, ask the court for an OSC re-sanctions. We cannot artificially separate parents from their children and, their, and, and impair their ability to visit on issues that really have nothing to do with the dependency process. And unless the parents are shown to be detrimental to the children, unless there is a concrete showing of some kind of endangerment, speculative endangerment, I think, is insufficient to curtail visitation or liberalization of visitation. And I think once, you know, and, and the other problem becomes, it becomes a fate accompli. You set the kids 80 miles away, and now let's say the criminal case is resolved, uh, whatever, but the kids are still 80 miles away. What efforts are being made to bring them back in now? Now that there's no more uh, a big question of, of uh, endangerment, because the, 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 the testimonies and everything are over and done with. I see subsequently that nothing is being done. And that leaves the parents in a very precarious position. It puts upon them the burden to visit, to try and liberalize the visits. If so, where are the visits going to be liberalized? Where are the visits going to take place? There are a lot of things that need to be worked out, and the place to work them out is in, in the trial court. The details have to be worked out in the trial court. In, in that particular case, I think, um, if I recall correctly, the, there was a happy ending in the sense that <laughs> the parents relocated, <laughs> moved closer to the children and were able to visit, and I think in time they were able to get the kids back. But I, I can't suggest that as an alternative for, for, for us having provided reunification services. And, okay. 
Now, something that's probably not as exciting but is just as important is that, well, I, I guess I should start from the beginning. I'm seeing and I'm very encouraged in seeing in the records that trial counsel for parents are coming in at get-go and asking for a written visitation schedule which can be implemented at, at detention or shortly thereafter and the court says yes let's I order a written visitation schedule and one thing that is not always put in the order and I think it should is that the parents be consulted in in the social worker devising this visitation schedule because sometimes the only people that are consulted is the foster parent. Well, the foster parent's availability and the parent's ability to visit should not, uh, it, it should, the foster parent's availability should not impede the parent's ability to, to visit as often as possible, <coughs> which is the precursor of, of, of having to then liberalize the visits. So we should have times and places which are amenable and perhaps a meeting of the minds and a meeting between the two is if the children are placed far away that the parents can participate in visits that happen more often and, and, and are more productive so that we can move then to liberalization. But what I see in the orders is this plain order, DCFS write the visitation order. Next thing I see is DCFS has written one, but it doesn't fit the parent, it, and the parent is complaining, hey, you said it during my working hours, you said it during the time I'm doing parenting, I can't comply with this, and yet that there's no meshing. Uh, once the department takes a position, hey, we gave you the visitation order, then it's up to the parent to comply with it, and that puts them at a disadvantage if they have other things going in being able to, to, to reunify. I think... There should, and also, and sometimes the court makes the order and there's no follow up. Mm -hmm. We come back the next, uh, uh, in a month, specifically for that reason, and I, I see the department making one excuse after another, after another, as to why they have not implemented this plan. Again, I suggest that as parents' attorneys, we think about suggesting an OSC re-sanctions, because I think if the department starts <coughs> understanding that we are very serious about enforcing the court's orders and that we want them to, to perform as, as ordered by the court without excuses, that they're going to start honoring these orders of the court in a proper time frame to allow the parent to be able to reunify to allow the parent to be able to visit more often and not to be able to fault the parent for the inadequate visitation schedule that has been established. So, again, uh, <coughs> I guess there's some work to be done and unfortunately it starts with trial counsel but believe me we at the appellate level will be more than happy to carry the ball once you set it in motion because we're seeing a lot of this and i'm seeing even as late as the 12-month review where we're still dinkering with the place of visitation and the foster parent doesn't think she can make it here and we're, we're not liberalizing because uh, there haven't been enough visits and we don't know the quality of the visits and we don't know how the parent is going to react. Well, everything is contingent on everything else. And if we don't set the ball in motion from arraignment detention and uh, even as late as this position, with each passing phase of the proceeding, the court becomes less interested and 
the final analysis may be that we're, we're unable to, to liberalize visits enough for a, for a reunification. And of course, it's a two-way two process. I know, as many of you, that sometimes our clients wait till the next month, that six-month review hearing, to let us know that they haven't been getting their re, uh, their visitation. Hmm. We come into the six-month review, and it's the first time we find out, gee, I haven't had one visit because I call the social worker all the time. She doesn't respond to my calls. Uh, I try and set it on such and such a date. The social worker changes the, the time period on me, and. What I used to suggest to my clients when I was in that position, which I was for five years, I used to practice out of 412 in Genzer's court. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> during the years 1995 to 2000, um, I would suggest to my clients start keeping a diary. Get a cheap calendar from the dollar store and start marking down. I called social worker today at 3.30, couldn't get a hold. I called social worker at 4.30 and, and no answer, or she told me I, I, uh, to wait to the next hearing to bring it to the court's attention. And I would uh, tell my clients, don't wait for the six months. Call me back within, an hour, uh, within a month. If you're not getting your visits, call me back. I'll have a recourse. I can do a, a walk-in. I can uh, walk on. <laughs> I, I can do a 388. I can do anything to, pre, to try and safeguard your rights, but I must know about it ahead of time. I must know about it in order to amass the documentation in case I have to file a 388. If I'm presented with it for the first time at the, uh, the six month review, there's not much I can do other than pure argument, and sometimes it doesn't fly. So this is something that has to be set up between you and your client early on. There is another problematic area with visitation, and that unfortunately is mostly having to do with dads. Dads, a mom independency from get-go is recognized as a mom and she has rights, and she has enforceable rights, and things flow from it. A dad comes in, and he has to prove that he is either at the, at the least biological, and, and the best is that he is presumed dead. Now, this process can take some time. And let's say that for whatever reason, we have a Kelsey-esque kind of a situation, fathers prevented from coming to court in the earlier stages of the proceedings due to fraud of mom, whatever, not being notified, etc. He comes in, he asks for a DNA test, especially if he's been told by mom or other parents, other people in the family, you may not be the dad. And that process takes another couple of months. <coughs> Now, some courts are doing two things. Some courts are saying, okay, Dad, uh, we're going to start visits for you pending the, the DNA testing, and then we will re-examine it again at that stage and see where we go from there. Other courts have, are saying, we're, we're going to hold off any contact until we find out if you're even bio dad. And I would suggest that you have a very serious discussion with your client when he first comes in and you're appointed for that man. Is he truly going to be, want to be a dad to this child? Does he want to parent whether he is bio dad or not? If he says yes, then let's pursue reunification from get-go because case law says he doesn't have to be bio dad 
to be able to uh, uh, become presumed or even quasi-presumed. And we have cases that have extended the quasi-presumed of Kelsey S. to non-biological dads. In fact, our own department, uh, Division 7, has done that in Jerry P. So if, in fact, a man is serious about wanting to be a dad to this kid, give him the tools or ask for them. If it doesn't happen, you may consider about appealing it. That may take some time, however, so you may consider going to your friendly red attorney and discussing the issue with them. They may be able to take fast court action where we cannot. And the reason I'm saying this is because lately there seems to be a backlog and I'm getting appeals eight months after they were filed or more. And then that's in cases where we have the entire record, which may not always be there, which we need to then ask for, which takes another couple of months to, to complete. So all that time, if you're relying on an appeal, it's not doing uh, that man any, any service. And then if we come back, okay, so that, that's get-go. If, if the guy wants to really be a dad, fine. If he says no, uh, I'll wait and see if this child is mine before I, I make a commitment to the child, then he needs to be explained that, you know what, in two, three months, the court may not extend to you any visitation or any kind of services because the case progresses and some judicial officers are taking the position that, hey, kid's been in foster care, adoptive parents all this time, I'm not going to disturb him. You came too late into the case. You didn't visit until you were determined to be a father. And therefore, I'm not going to give you any, uh, any visitation and, and the story for that man. This is a risk that the parent has to be advised of and take. He needs to know. So, um, the courts on appeal have been dicey on this issue. Some have said yes, uh, that's, uh, it's been a, it, there's been a due process violation, especially in cases where the father was artificially prevented from coming, meaning mom tells him you're not dead, you're not dead, you're not dead. Uh, meaning social services doesn't bother looking for him even when they have an inkling that he may be a father because they have another, another man that has shown up. And the courts have said, so, excuse me, some courts say, yeah, let's give him a sporting chance. Let's give him six months of, of, of visits and whatever. Other courts have said, tough luck, you came too late. Kid's about to be adopted. I'm not going to disturb his psyche by, by allowing you to enter his life. I have argued on the side of allowing the parent a sporting chance. I think the parent deserves a due process chance to parent his own kid, especially in cases where he's non-offending, when there is nothing wrong with the man, other than he came on the scene a little too late because of circumstances beyond his control. I've had mixed results. But uh, I think that we need to, to pursue that because also remember, now California uh, recognizes more than two parents for a child. And it's not good enough for someone in the trial court to say, well, you know, we already have a presumed father, we got uh, the mom, what, what, what more do we need to, to crowd the kid's life with with any additional man? But that isn't the law. The law has recognized that in appropriate cases and where it, it is in the best interest of the child, that we look at the third parent, and then if we have to decide which of the competing fathers, if there are competing fathers, which best serves, which under the weightier policy considerations is going to provide, we're going to safeguard and we're going to recognize as the father of the child. 
this area is becoming extremely complex. It is not my intent today to, to go into it, but it, <laughs> every case that comes out seems to tweak it one way or another. I don't think we have any definitive answers, but at least if you raise the issues, then on appeal, we have the luxury you don't have in the trial court. We have the 2,000 pages of transcript to sit and read and distill sometimes over and over until we come up with, with an analysis of the situation. You may have the report uh, uh, on that morning. Uh, moreover, you may not be the initial attorney. And this is what I'm also seeing. There's been a lot of turnover. And not every attorney who comes into the case is aware of everything that's gone on before. There is a change of counsel. Sometimes <coughs> there's a change of judicial officers, uh, minors counsel. And there are hearings that I see where literally nobody really seems to know what was on, on calendar, what the issues were, what the prior orders were, so they can, they can extrapolate and go forward. And I think it's not um, beyond our powers to say that if in fact we are the new attorney on the case and I'm, I'm hit with a 60-page report, then Your Honor, I would like an extension of time so that I can distill this report. I was not trial counsel uh, at the last hearing. I think that most courts would willingly grant us a little time to familiarize ourselves with, with what went on so that we can make the proper decisions when we come back. But again, I, I recognize very well your caseloads, <laughs> and I recognize that sometimes you don't have that discretion, but in proper circumstances, you may consider it. And, um, okay. Now, there's one area that's developing that, frankly, I definitely do not know the answers. And that's the area of the incorrigible teenager cases that we're starting to see. Thanks to the Supreme Court who has determined in their wisdom that irregardless of how good of a parent they may have, that child belongs to dependency and that child is uh, subject to, to our reunification uh, efforts. We now have a parent whom we want to reunify and who may want to reunify with the child, but what are the tools for this parent? What kind of visitation do we grant this parent with the runaway child that half the time can't be even kept in the foster homes. <clears throat> it's a challenge. Um, what kind of, and one of the things that plays into it is visits under a therapeutic setting. Gee, that's wonderful. <laughs> to be decided by, by minus counsel, by minus therapist when she's ready. Well, I've seen cases where Minor's therapist comes in and testifies, it's not my call to make that conjoint determination. My focus is my client who has other issues. I am, do not want to be put in a position to make that recommendation nor to conduct those conjoint sessions. Parent counsel, parent therapist may be saying by the same token, Hey, mom is ready, willing, and able. Let's get going. Where are those conjoint counselors? And nothing is happening in the trial court. Over and over and over. This is another one of those situations that seem to get away. And I think perhaps a suggestion from the beginning, we should ask that an independent therapist be assigned for the, for the conjoint. That mom can take care of her business with her therapist without a commingling of, of therapy. <coughs> child can take care of her, her issues, and their mutual issues, they can take care of together uh, in conjoint counseling. I don't see why that has to wait till 
they resolve whatever issues they have with the rest of the world or themselves. That's a very narrow area. It's interpersonal relationship between mom and the child, which obviously hasn't worked for the 16 years or 17 years that it's been going on. So I think we, we, we already know, we're very focused on the issue of that conjoint counseling. We should be instituting it from the beginning to at least provide both sides a place to talk. Because otherwise, I don't think those parents are getting visits. It's, it's your call, it's your discretion, I'm just throwing it out as a possible alternative. Okay. I think I'm pretty much mostly done with the important you know, the stuff I wanted to cover. You guys have any questions that are non-specific to any case, and the reason I say that is because we have multiple legal firms here, <laughs> and because in years past I was part of the litigation when CLC commingled the ethical walls that we, we ended up having to bring litigation to ensure that they were properly maintained. So I don't think I want to answer any specific, but if you have nicely couched hypotheticals, if I can give it a shot, I will, and if I don't know the answer, you'll hear it too. Uh, anyone have any questions of any kind? Yes. Can you talk a little bit about when you have kids that are refusing to visit or declining to visit? This comes up all the time. It's particularly problematic with the older kids because you can't just pick them up and put them in the car, but I'm, it's bleeding into even younger and younger children. So can you talk about the record that I, you'd like to see on this? I, I agree, and I have a big problem with that as well because... Can you repeat the question, please? Yes. <laughs> the question was, how do we address the issue increasing, increasingly uh, uh, coming into the courts where the children are refusing to visit the parents. And this is becoming not just a problem with the older children, but it's now permeating down to the younger children. <laughs> Unfortunately, my first answer to that will be that I don't have an answer, because I don't know. On the one hand, as one judicial officer recently said, they are 